Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Dan of The Road Chose Me. Welcome to the show, Dan. Uh, Hi, Dan. As, as, as always, we are socially distanced. We've done it before it was mandated. Uh, I'm still in the Midwest. Ross is still in the Northeast. And Dan is joining us from the Canadian Rockies. That's right. Yeah, I'm sort of halfway between Vancouver and Calgary, and it is snowing hard outside. Really? How much are you supposed to get? Uh, it's been continuous, actually. We've been getting like six to 12 inches kind of every night now for the last week. Oh, my God. What? Yeah, it's coming down. It's really <laughs> nice. It's like full winter. <laughs> That's, I, that is something I can't even begin to th- like fathom. Like we got four inches. I mean, I, I love snowboarding, so uh, <laughs> okay. it's making me a happy person. So, so you're a season you, pass holder. Literally <laughs> fresh powder every day. That's pretty much it. Yeah. And, and I didn't even go today because I'm too exhausted. So I'm, I'm like resting <laughs> up so I can go tomorrow. That sounds like the best kind of problem. <laughs> it is, yeah. Uh, okay, we got six we got, to 12 got, inches. Oh, we got four yeah. inches on New Year's Day and we were all kind of like, all right, fine. We'll shovel this crap. But like, I don't want to deal with <laughs> right. it later. Yeah. We got nine inches the week before Christmas and it was like, it, it stopped the world over here. You know, that was the craziest thing to happen in like two years for the winter. Well, the, the glory of it being New Year's Day is nothing was really open. There was nothing to go do, but Starbucks was open. So we, we went and got a coffee. Mm. Like we, <laughs> we had to get out and drive in the snow. You I wanted to. to know what the Sequoia would do. You have to. Which by the way, uh, you don't have to put it in four wheel drive in four inches of snow and uh, it'll slide a little. <laughs> As it should. <laughs> That's, that's my personal update. Rear wheel drive. That's all I got. Your personal. Yeah. That's more <laughs> I, um, than my personal updates. Well, and it's it's still the horrible Mastercraft. Like I haven't got tires yet. So mm-hmm. Dan, I, I had a tire blow or not blow, but I had a tire go flat a couple, three weeks ago now. And I bought some 18 inch wheels that had some worn rubber on the back. And so right now I have 20s on my, my front axle and I have 18s on the rear and... <laughs> Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, that's not. Oh, that's not good. It's terrible. So you, you don't want to put it in four wheel drive, right? That would. (laughs) No, I don't want to. I don't want to blow a a transfer case throwing different rotational forces through. (laughs) Yeah, so that's why it stayed in two wheel drive, and that's why it was. I only, I did put it in four wheel drive, but it was for like, twelve feet. It was probably be okay literally to get it up the driveway that was it we'll, we'll go with that it'll be yeah. okay yeah it was not fine. and if it's not then you can do you know like an fj two-speed transfer case and it'll be even better oh, so God. stop spending my money ross i'm struggling <laughs> to spend my own <laughs> so i have to do it vicariously through other people <laughs> here you go here, here's the picture of how it's set up right now it's not it's not ideal <laughs> oh i didn't realize that that is not ideal no. it's, it's bad uh, it, it's but not good as soon as we make a decision on tires and pull the trigger, I'm waiting to hear back from a different contact. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then uh, a past guest has also re-asked me a question about them. So there might be a Good. third route that I investigate. So Excellent. Well, I may be driving down to Cape May, New Jersey this weekend to pick up a set of tires. Cooper ST Maxes but- on OEM Forerunner wheels for $150 for a set of four. What? kind of hard to pass up yeah yeah they're not brand new but they're better than uh they're better the tires than the currently Geo yeah, Landers, yeah. dan to fill you in real quick i recently purchased chris's forerunner <laughs> oh, <so. Okay. laughs> just, i'm not that good of a friend to know the exact tire on all of his vehicles just only the one uh, that i know that i put we- tires and on. i don't even know what's on them at the moment right. i just know that going downhill in the snowstorm a couple weeks ago i hit the brakes and it just kept going so it's time for some new tires it's heavy uh, that's because chris put his old worn out tires on there before he sold no them. they're they <laughs> actually have a ton of life left they're just yeah. <laughs> they're 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 a highway all season and that's yeah. it you know which all season um, stands for no season it, it does unfortunately but as i'm sure dan knows in the canadian rockies right now getting six <laughs> to 12 inches of snow a night <laughs> Yeah, right. actually, here it's the law. We have to run winter tires. They have to be like really? snowflake rated. Yeah, between like October and I think April. Is there uh, a chain pool. law for the passes? It's chains or winter tires, but but every passenger vehicle has to have winter tires anyway. But then wow. the, the trucks have to carry chains and they use them in the passes. Oh my God. So just to fill the audience that's listening in, um, Dan has famously driven a JKU Wrangler around a good portion of the world, it seems by this point. <laughs> 
<laughs> Definitely all of Africa. And I mean, qu- probably quite a lot of Canada by now too, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. And, and a lot of the US as well when I got mm-hmm. back. And then before that, I drove a TJ all the way from Alaska to Argentina. So you have KO2s on the Jeep. Currently and... not, no. Oh, I have really? uh, Yokohama Geolander XATs on there. Oh, how have those yeah. been doing? They are excellent. I really like them. From the minute I put them on, they're way quieter than the KO2s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and they seem to be way longer lasting as well. Like my how many Jeep... miles were the, on the KO2s by the time you got rid of them? Oh, I used up two sets in Africa, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. Off the top of my head, I, I can't remember exactly. Maybe I put on like 40,000 miles on each set. I can't remember. That's, actually, that's pretty strong uh, given the terrain you drove over and the tread pattern of the KO2. Mm. I know there's some people with the original BFG KOs that got like 70,000 miles out of them, which is kind of comical. And then there's people who are like, yeah, they wore out after 15. Well, mm. Mm. my Jeep's heavy too. So it definitely, uh, it definitely chews up tires as much as it can. Did you have to weigh it prior to putting it in the cargo container? No. Um, containers have a maximum weight limit of like, I think it's 40,000 pounds. And oh, so okay, yeah. at some point, <laughs> I remember them sort of asking me, they're like, is, is it going to be anything near that? I'm like, no, it's just a vehicle. And they're like, oh, yeah. we don't care at all. Then it's completely. I said <laughs> Jeep. It's a Jeep. Because I'm sure there's people, we had a few guests on recently from like, you know, Earth Cruiser and those vehicles are still only what 15,000 pounds or so oh, he told us and i can't remember yeah i can't remember either i, I know it was it was a, a large number but it wasn't anywhere near 40 14 yeah, i think you have to work pretty hard to hit the weight limit on a shipping container like yeah lead ingots or something <laughs> it's like you gotta work hard multiple vehicles multiple unmarked uh very heavy packages <laughs> yeah just to be but, fact check, Earth Cruiser is fourteen thousand pounds. Okay, I was it's only seven tons. That's still pretty heavy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so okay, so good to hear about the Yokohamas because for a long time, and I'm sure you know, the off road world was you buy a BFG or you buy like a Mickey Thompson, you know, or something in that vein, or, or like a, a Goodyear MTRs were the big thing in the late two thousands. I'm sure you remember, and now. I mean, Cooper and Falcon and Yokohama, and they're all just like blowing up on the scene. And it's, I, Boy, yeah. I'm Toyo, especially Nito. Um, I'm all about it. Max yeah, I agree. Is... Even General Tire have their, what is that, the GT3 or something? Like, yeah. yeah there's uh, so, uh, many, so many of the companies now making quality tires, which is great. Mm-hmm. Better for us. Yes, absolutely. Uh, more is always better with tires. But yeah, good to hear about the, uh, about the Yokohamas. Um, we could go a million different places here and I'm sure Chris is going to get a kick out of anything and everything we talk about. And so the guests. So, I mean, Chris and I, we usually start the show. We talk about our own personal updates. I got nothing. I'm it's the Northeast in the winter and it's, you know, it's the sucks. spring the winter of 2020 to 2021. So nothing's is, happening here. Is the head unit installed? No. Uh, <laughs> it's day. I stopped counting. Um, Dan, the, the background story is in order to add Bluetooth to the 2005 Forerunner, you have to replace the head unit. In order to maintain a backup camera, you have to replace the backup camera. It's been a bit of a process. Uh, today, I routed the wire from the backup camera down the side of the tailgate, through the tailgate harness, into the headliner, and down the headliner. And that took all of my hour long lunch. So tomorrow I resume running the wires from the back of the truck to the front of the truck. So I'm doing this like, it probably could have been done in one Saturday, but I don't have a garage and I don't have a driveway. So I do it on my lunch at the shop. And it's, uh, it's yeah, I stopped counting how many days. The guys in the shop are actually joking. Like they'll walk over and be like, hmm, day 12, still not done. I'm like, <laughs> you're not helping. <laughs> I think Thanks. this is at least our fourth show where you've referenced it now. Yeah. Well, the, the first few, it was sitting in a box, but now the truck is still everybody who, cause the whole center consoles out, the tunnels like removed the dashboards partially still disassembled. And it's, it's, 
it looks like somebody broke into it and stripped it of anything of value. Are you leaving um, this at work or are you driving it back oh and no. forth still? No, I drive it back and forth. <laughs> Torn and it's, it's really funny because the, the rectangular panel that has the climate control is just attached by one little harness with like a dongle clip and it, it's moving around. There's nowhere to put it. So like, I'll go to change the temperature while I'm driving and I have to like reach over to the passenger side and like catch this thing that's flopping around. It's, uh, it's a two hand job. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But let's, um, let's, pre let's pretend I didn't say that in case my insurance is listening. Uh, allegedly, <laughs> all of the above. So I haven't, I got nothing else. And usually we also talk about industry news of which I think the only actual news is supposedly the 392 Wrangler is going to be priced at like seventy-five dollars to $77,000. And Dan and I touched on this very briefly, but that- That's a lot of money. That is Huge. a lot of money for a Wrangler. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, when I, it's I think hard to when imagine I, that, hard to imagine they plan on selling like a bunch of them every year. You know, they, they mm -hmm. can't be expecting tens of thousands. I don't think at that price. It no. it is not far off from what like Hellcats and Demons were priced at though when they came out. And those things are. I feel like if I see a Challenger now, I'm disappointed it's not. A Hellcat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, they're all over the place. Like. And I also think this doesn't put us very far away from the six-figure Wrangler. The six-figure Wrangler is terrifying. It's terrifying, but it's well, coming. Yeah, I guess there's also, have you talked about the rumors of them building an aftermarket, you know, a factory right next to the production line in Toledo? I read that. Yeah, because supposedly they want to start selling like upfitted Wranglers, you know, mm -hmm. so they can get in the aftermarket world. That's and right. at that point, I think the six-figure Wrangler will be easy. Right. So well, it, you bought your literally... bone stock, I assume, right? I did, yep. Okay. I'm sure you've driven past the dealerships where on one side of the parking lot, they have stock vehicles and then parked up front, like along the street, it's like rough country lift and 35s and nothing to go all, along with it. All dealer installed. And yeah. And it's an $8,000 markup. So oh, really? we there actually, were we have spot a shots. local uh, dealer oh, that does the mercenary package. We, we have talked about this. We've talked about this. It's not okay. good. It's it's, it's not. really not good. Uh, it's questionable at best. It's angry eyes, the Jeep, basically. It, it's angry eyes and like weird font. Yeah, it's not it's not good. Um, but th there's pictures floating around of that red four-door Rubicon with the half doors, mm. which kind of kicked rumors into a whirlwind, but I don't know. Hmm. Would you have optioned anything differently on yours? Were you to do it again? Well, actually, I bought mine used um, in the Ooh. interest of saving money. Um, and so my requirements were four-door, six-speed Rubicon. That, mm -hmm. was, that was what I wanted. And I basically just like scoured, you know, the used form Craigslist mm -hmm. until one came up and I jumped on it. And today it would have been Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And funny enough, it actually has heated seats, which is uh, probably least used feature while I was in Africa. <laughs> right? Are they the cloth seats or the leathers? Uh, they're cloth seats. They're, uh, heated cloth seats. Okay, yeah. Did you even use that at like, if you were out at night? Well, actually, no. you can probably attest to this, but what was night travel like and did you do it at all? Right. So uh, night travel is really, really unsafe in kind of any developing or undeveloped country. Um, there's just so many hazards on the road. There's potholes, there's, you know, unsigned speed humps, people walking, animals, mm -hmm. beasts of burden, just so many surprises around every corner. And so as a rule, I try really, really hard not to drive at night. It just, and every time I ever did it, I regretted it badly. Really? It was like yeah. scary from the get-go or like something yeah. happened? Yeah, yeah, super stressful always. Um, and you just feel, you know, like the world's out to get you when it's dark, you know, like mm -hmm. there's bad guys around the corner, <laughs> even when there isn't. Um, and I right. did actually, I smoked a pothole in Guinea in West Africa and broke a sway bar end link. Uh, the Jeep actually bounced off the ground when it came out of the oh. pothole. Oh, that yeah. must have been, man. Yeah, like and I didn't even see off it. seat and then like poo came out. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, that was, you know, the, the loudest bang you can imagine as all four bump stops like just smashed into the, oh, yeah, into the uh, battle wake axle. up. Yeah, it sure did. Yeah, and it was, yeah, it was pitch black, pouring rain. I couldn't see a thing. Oh God. Yeah, that's like the worst conditions to be driving in. <laughs> the rain didn't cushion it at all? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, not. <laughs> Water's not soft. <laughs> no, and the pothole lurking beneath will never be. Oh. 
Oh man, that's, yeah, that's, that's scary. And I mean, I'm, I'm guessing those few instances in which you did drive at night, you were probably exhausted by then, right? They were after like long days of travel when you were still trying to just get to where you needed to be. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you always, you get in that sort of mentality of like, if I just keep pushing on, everything will get better. And somehow it seems like a good idea. And it's not until later in hindsight when you're like, that was really dumb. Right. It's like, we were just, I mean, we, I spoke or alluded to moving target earlier. And that is like, you think if you get over that next hump of exhaustion, you'll be fine. And it's never fine because something always just drains you even more. Exactly. Yeah. That's scary. Did you encounter at all any of the roads where like suddenly oncoming traffic was just a thing in your own lane? Oh, definitely. Oh yeah. In pretty much every country, that's how really? it is. Hmm. Yep. Yep. Um, driving is just vastly different when you're in, as soon as you hit the border of Mexico, really, in, in hmm. any of Latin America or Africa, it's, I call it make it up driving. It's way more fluid. It's way more just like if there's space, just cram in, even hmm. if it's the wrong lane, even if it's on the wrong side of the road. Hmm. But it's, it's kind of interesting because it's, as long as everyone's paying attention, you don't really see too many accidents. Um, it's kind of not until you're out on the highway and high speeds are involved. And then it, it almost turns into like a game of chicken and that's right. where you see accidents. And that's where, they're, that's where they're really bad accidents. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. That's but really in towns, scary. you know, like four way stop sign, that, that's just a four way go sign. And, 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 and everybody goes <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't really matter because if, as long as everyone's going, you can watch each other and you can avoid each other. Right. Right. Yeah. You said, you know, everybody's at least paying attention. That's the problem here is that everybody's just distracted did, were there a lot of distracted drivers or it's just, it's mayhem. Everybody's doing what they're going to do. And, and that's kind of it. Yeah. I would say it's mayhem and, and people seem to pay attention a lot more. And, and interestingly, mm. you really only need to pay attention to what's in front of you. You, you never really care about your blind spots. And, mm. and if you need to just slam on the brakes for some reason, you do because the car behind you can see you so easily. Right. And, and you just sort of rely on that fact. Mm. You're in front, you just do whatever you want. That's pretty funny. It's really like, it, it's, at first it's really intimidating and then it turns into being quite fun and quite mm -hmm. like exhilarating to just like merge into a roundabout with like 50 motorbikes, <laughs> in like, you know, less than a foot off your bumper. Oh. And it just doesn't matter. It, you just smile at the motorbike rider, right. rider and like, he doesn't care at all. So you had dabbled in that in your, in the first trip, but how long did it take to really, for that to become second nature? Because I went to Italy on my honeymoon and the driving, I thought it was going to be an, unlearnable curve and it was after 45 minutes it was just normal you know bikes flying by and people making crazy passes and you just do everything you can to to adapt and it, it just works out was it like the next day for you or did that take a little, a little while i think starting in mexico is kind of a nice soft introduction so it's not too crazy mm -hmm. and then so you get used to that you know in a couple of days or a week but then sort of different countries like Peru is absolutely insane. And then so like, really, yeah, busters come around hairpin corners on the wrong side of the road in the mountains, like oh, well, that's every, fun. every day. And pretty much the newspaper every single day in Peru front page bus goes off cliff. 50 people are dead. Like it's, uh... it's just life in Peru. Yeah. <laughs> Note it, to potential future self. Don't get on a bus in Peru. As soon as you see them drive, you completely understand why. Yeah. Um, oh, but yeah, sure. I think I think I've sort of spent years getting used to it more and more. And when I drove into Cairo in Egypt, that still at the end of the Africa expedition, that still raised my eyebrows of like, <laughs> this is the most nutty thing I've ever seen in my yeah. life. <laughs> wow. Of all places. That's pretty funny. How was, uh, I mean, we know there's lorries and then there's also motorcycles with other vehicles on the road. Was the Jeep like comparably sized or were you kind of an outlier? Uh, it really, it depended on the country and it probably depended like how close to the capital city I was. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Africa is like land cruisers and land rovers and, you know, four wheel drive vehicles of some sort, pickup trucks, be they dilapidated, but still similar size, I guess. To I the Jeep. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then when you do see the enormous transport trucks, you basically just get out of the way because they won't stop at, you know, a, a four way stop for them is literally a go. They, they have no interest. They don't even look because it's just, it's your job to avoid them is how it works. Um, That's terrifying. <laughs> but then it, you know, it, it sort of goes down the chain like that. Like I can treat motorbikes the same way. Mm -hmm. I can, I can just go and motorbikes will go around me. And, and that's right. sort of like the rules of the road. That's pretty funny. I, 
Yeah, I, I, I look forward to experiencing that at some point because when I moved to the city that I live in now, there's an unwritten rule that right turn on red is okay. Uh, it, it, there, there's no law that says it is. It's just people think that you can make a right turn or a left turn for that matter. More, actually, no, I, I misspoke. Right turn on red is legal. Left turn on red is very illegal. <laughs> but sense. people in this city do left turn on red like it's normal. Really? Really. And it, it absolutely shocked me because I grew up going to New York City, which right turn on red is illegal. So yep. here, right turn on red, people still kind of hesitate. But left turn on red is just like it all the time, all everywhere. And it, it's, it's mayhem. So I don't know. I, I think at some point still probably be absolutely baffled by people's driving, <laughs> but that's uh, crazy. Um, I mean, God, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, do you want so, to start in the Americas or do you want to start in Africa, yeah. Ross? Where do you want to start? Let's, or do you want to start let, in Australia? Like, Go back to the beginning. It's just say, back that's to the where beginning. the action so, comes from. So how far back do you want to go? <laughs> yeah. Well, what got you into off-roading? Because we've had so many guests on that are either... I got into off-roading from the day I could, you know, walk and grow up with it. And then we have people who are like, oh, I got into off-roading in the last five years because of, of motorsport. So how was your start? Yeah, it's fairly recent for me, actually. Um, growing up in Australia, the, like the family road trip is a real thing. And you go camping on the beach, you know, you take a tent and all the gear. And we did that every year as a family. And, and we did tour quite a bit of the country. But dad didn't have a four-wheel drive. And I would say we, you know, we barely went off gravel roads. It was oh, wow. we had a family station wagon, you know, loaded to the hill. So it wasn't until I came to North America about 10 or 12 years ago, I needed a vehicle to get around in the winter. And someone said, oh, you should buy a Jeep. They're great in the snow. And I had no idea. I'd, I'd never owned a four-wheel drive. Mm. So I bought a Cherokee, a rust bucket. Uh, and it was great. Uh, oh <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I wanted to go hiking and camping and kayaking and, and get remote. Mm. And that Cherokee went everywhere I ever wanted to go and more. So then I sort of just, I, I wouldn't say I'm even really an off-road enthusiast, more of like exploring and, you know, I want to go to wild places. Yeah. yeah. And kind of the more the travel has, has motivated me to, to have these vehicles that can take me anywhere I want to go. Mm -hmm. So what brought you to the States and also what happened to the Cherokee? <laughs> uh, I finished university in Australia and was so burnt out I didn't want to get a real job <laughs> so I came Fair over enough. to North America to, to work at ski resorts uh, I was a cool. lifty you know working on the chairlift I was a snowboard instructor I was a <laughs> ski patroller oh so uh, you're really you were saying that you snowboard until you're exa too exhausted to go oh. the next day you're re that's really like your <laughs> life Yep. Yeah, yeah. It was my life for a lot of years. Um, and then I ran out of money and I had to go back and get a real job and all of that. And, but just over the years, I've, I've really fallen in love with North America and the mountains, the mm -hmm. seasons, you know, the snow. Uh, yeah. I love it over here. It's, it's great. What's the highest elevation in Australia? It, it can't be more than a couple thousand feet, right? Yeah. It's not much at all. Um, I want to say three or 4,000 feet. Uh, oh, it's just like, yeah, it's, it's a hill. You can just walk to the top of it. Three or four thousands, what like we have in Connecticut and, and New York. So that's that's, right. that's pretty low. What's the highest you've taken the Jeep? Oh, I drove the Jeep to fourteen thousand feet in Ethiopia. Um, okay. that's pretty good and high. I think it was fourteen thousand. I can look up the photo yeah. I took of my GPS. That sounds right in my memory. I hiked at twelve in Colorado and I was like shot the next day like exhausted I know, highest like point in australia is seven thousand three hundred and nine feet oh, seven thousand okay. whoa yeah so there you go i have no idea don't listen to me i, I don't it, know it came <laughs> from a website that was dot gov dot au so i'm pretty sure it's the geo it's, it's literally geoscience <laughs> australia website like i think it's the de okay. Australian department of <laughs> geology yeah. i guess i'll defer to them <laughs> yeah. probably say they know a little bit more than i do even yeah. so the top seven of the page says australian government geoscience australia i was like that's that's a lot of australia for a title guys <laughs> if words, they were both of them are australia <laughs> yeah if they were uh, imitating anybody they would be doing a real they'd be trying really hard <laughs> but average elevation is only 300 meters so that's like 900 feet ish yeah yep hmm. i was like i still have okay. google open i can do that so yeah, had you 
there's one mountain range kind of on the east coast of Australia, and it, and it does get snow. We do have ski resorts. That was uh, my next question. Other than that, the rest of Australia is dead flat. Straight desert. Yeah. Well, Where in Australia are you from? Because we have one of our regular co-hosts and co-writers is from Australia. Okay. Yeah. I, I grew up in the country uh, in the state of Victoria. And so mm. usually I say that I'm from Melbourne and, and around. So sort of Southern <laughs> Eastern. Okay. That's where, that's where Joel's out now, but he grew up in yep. Tasmania. Mm. Oh yeah. And yeah I've only, never been, you know, I, I he only ever so calls little it, of my own country. Yeah. He oh, only I, ever calls it Taz and I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. No, no, we live too far away to casually call it Taz. Yeah. Like to use Australian slang just, just sounds ridiculous at a guy in the middle of the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> literally on the opposite side of the world exactly. <laughs> so how was the uh how was the trip in the tj because chris had a tj i've spent more time in tjs than i can possibly begin to explain uh did it it beat the crap out of you didn't it you know actually it didn't um you're gonna be a bit annoyed to hear this but basically like <laughs> it had it had stock bumpers i had no winch i had no fridge i literally just had my backpacking gear in the back of it Okay. you know a bag of clothes and a box of food mm -hmm. so i mean that thing was extremely light that, which meant yeah, it, that'll do you it. know it was it was great actually it never broke down once it handled everything i ever wanted it to because it was so stock and so light you know it wasn't really working very hard day to day yeah there it it is. A, a four liter or a two five that actually is a two five. Oh nice. man wow so you probably got like 20 ish miles per gallon maybe yeah 19 every single day of the expedition that's really not terrible for a long trip what was getting gas like down in in the southern part of mexico uh yeah no mexico is really developed no problem at all really um, huh. all of central america in fact i'd wager you can't get more than 200 miles from a gas station like even huh. if you tried wow because it is you know it's fairly small you know on a sure. landmass scale and it's developed. There's paved roads all over the place. There's good gas stations everywhere. So it was mostly a pavement trip or was uh, it uh, with excursions off on whenever possible? Yeah, I tried as hard as I could to stay off the pavement and mm -hmm. always go for excursions. But I would say, yeah, there was nearly 50% probably overall was still mm -hmm. pavement. Wow. And what, any idea roughly what percentage of the Africa trip was tarmac versus not? Uh, it's a total guess, but I'd say something like maybe 20 or 30% was pavement and the rest was not. And even then probably, probably 90% of the gravel, like I wasn't even in four wheel drive. It was, you know, a Subaru okay. road, if you want to call yeah. it that. And then maybe, maybe 10% of it, maybe 20% of it was kind of like, all right, yeah, I, I might get stuck here. This is sort of, I better pay attention. <laughs> And then like the extra like one or two percent on the far stream that's like, oh, this is gonna be bad. <laughs> yeah, and that's where it's just like, can I get around this or do I have no choice but to go through it? Mm -hmm. Did you ever encounter anybody else on their own overlanding or off-roading excursion that were like unrecoverable or just totally beach somewhere? Uh like other foreigners. Yeah, other people trying to just go on an adventure who are like way in over their head or just got stuck in a huge mud pit that was just part of the road. I never did encounter anyone that was like hopelessly in trouble. Um, mm. Because I think, you know, a lot of people always ask, how did you persevere, you know, when things went wrong or, you know, when you couldn't get a visa or you had malaria or like all the, all the trouble times. And basically the answer is you just persevere until you mm. find a solution. Mm. And so it doesn't really matter whether it takes a day, a week or a month. If you're stuck in the mud, you will get out. Right. You, just, you just have to because it's your house. It's got your passport in it. You, you legally can't keep it in the country for too long. Mm -hmm. So overlanders, I think, who are going global, they're a special sort of stubborn. They're a special sort of determined <laughs> where it's just like, well, yes, this is very annoying and this is going to take a long time. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing with my life. So it, I'll just show up at the customs office every single day <laughs> for the rest of my life until this issue is resolved. <laughs> and so then, you know, it has, it has to get resolved. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, people always, did you find someone who like was, you know, totally hopelessly and like, no, they were just solving their problem, you know, one right. hour at a time and however long it took, that's how long it took. Right. And they'd probably say the same thing about you too, if they were, uh, if they came across you, but yeah, Chris, Chris just pulled up. <laughs> I mean, talk about, i obviously not hopeless because you got it out of there, but you had a, a small mishap with um 
what some people would joke about the Jeep was just tired and decided to take a nap. Um, it was on its side. It was the e-brake cable, right? It was the e-brake. It's sort of embarrassing, but <laughs> basically I got out to take a photo. Uh, I left it in first gear. It's, you know, it's a six speed and the e-brake didn't hold. And actually because it's so heavy, it turned over the engine. So even in first gear, it will roll yeah. as I learned. Uh, and so it went forward maybe like four or five car lengths and then it, it smacked into a rock bank and that kicked it over onto the passenger oh. side. If it hadn't hit that rock bank, would you still be chasing it? So on that side of the road Sorry. was kind of, no, no, it's a valid question. That side of the road was kind of a rock bank for a while, mm -hmm. but had it have veered to the other side, it literally would have gone off a cliff. Oh, like, shit. Oh. Like, I don't know, a hundred foot cliff. Oh, like, man. Literally destroyed. So, so lesser of two evils by quite a substantial margin. When it came back up on its wheels and that night I kind of, I cleaned it all out and I really assessed everything. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, on a scale of bad to really bad, I got off pretty lightly. Yeah, the <laughs> pictures the pictures don't allude to the cliff behind where you took that picture from. Right, you can see the rock bank kind of under the wheels there. Yeah, yeah, yeah like under where the people are standing. That's, you know, that's the driver's tire hit that and that's what kicked mm -hmm. it over. But yeah, sort of behind, I guess, me taking the photo, maybe another like 30 or 40 yards down, it, it just gets really steep really fast. Holy shit. Yeah, I mean, it... You can kind of see behind the trees on the top left of the picture. It looks like it, there's just sky behind yeah, that. Mm -hmm. And it kind of just falls away. Um, yeah, the road was kind of like up on this ridge, like following, you know, these little yeah. sort of mountainy things. Steeper than it looks, right? We love to talk about how pictures are, they never give away how steep something is in person. Right, yeah. And, and really not that bad. I mean, I thought the e-brake was going to hold it, you know, because mm. I, I did know that it was not good and I did know that it might move. I just never expected it to happen so suddenly. <laughs> Good place for a tap, all things considered. Oh, I mean, I was I was terrified. That's like fairly remote in Uganda. I hadn't seen a vehicle for a couple of hours. I <sighs> I was I really hit my limit. You know, I collapsed on the ground and I really thought about I was just gonna have to take my passport out and start walking. Holy oh, shit. Yeah. There was nobody there. It was no, just there like, was nobody there. There was oh, no vehicles and like I didn't have any clue of where I would walk to. I just kind of started thinking about like mm -hmm. Maybe this is it. Maybe I've finally done it. Where'd the people come from? That's a great question. And <laughs> the joke in Africa... They heard the noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the joke in Africa is you are never alone, especially when you think you are. So <laughs> pretty much if there is a road, there are people living near the road. You know, mm. they've got a little mud hut with a straw roof. And so especially as a white person, especially a big loud crash like that, Absolutely, they just showed up because they heard it and they wanted to know what was going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so That's people right. always they like materialize out of the jungle or out of the desert or whatever, and it's always shocking. You're like, where, where did you come from? And they're like, Oh, I'm just walking. <laughs> <laughs> For how long now? And they're like, Yeah, oh, I don't know, a week. That's not a thing in the states. People would be totally caught off guard by that every single time. You know? Yeah, yeah. It if takes some getting used to, especially like just when you're having a bathroom break or. Like just when you're about to sit down to dinner and these people show up, you're like, whoa, oh, hello, how are you? Right. I've been on a couple ATV trails that cross the Appalachian and you'll be sitting there like on the top of a mountain kind of looking off, you know, at a ridge or something and somebody sneaks up behind you and you don't know they're there until like they sit down and it is one of the scariest things ever. <laughs> like you're looking around like, okay, who's going to hear me if I yell? <laughs> you know, and they're thinking the same thing. But in this picture, so you had, you were using, is that Garmin? You're running a Garmin GPS? That's right, yep. And you would have just yoinked it out of the Jeep if you had to and and just gone walking. Yeah, I I mean, I just driven in on that road, probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 miles from the last town I was in. So I just would have started walking back down the road, I guess. Is is the note on the yeah. dash for what side of the road you need to be driving on? <laughs> that is exactly what the note on the dash is for. Oh my God. And, and I hear you laughing, but it's like, a, it's a real thing. So in Africa, kind of most of Southern Africa, they drive on the left-hand side of the road. But the thing is, as you come back up, because of the countries I chose to go to, I swapped sides back and forward a few times. And so it's kind of a real thing. You wake up in the morning, you know, you're mm -hmm. camping out in the jungle somewhere, you get in and you start driving and you're just on a gravel road and there's no one else around and you really pause and you think to yourself, 
what country am I in? What, what side of the road am I supposed to be on? And it, it becomes a real problem. And, and actually, even at a couple of borders, I, the, that one right there, good, good pick up on the photo, the Uganda border, I was going into Rwanda here and I drove off and then actually did a U-turn and came back and asked the military guy. I was like, which side of the road am I supposed to be on? And he was like, other side, buddy, swap sides. Oh my God. Because there are no signs. There's like nobody, nothing helps you. You just you just make it up and, and then drive away on the other side of the road. I mean, it, it sounds like in some places it wouldn't really matter, but it's that could be very, very concerning. They don't make you change anything. Either. It's just, you just go from one to the other. There's no... Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's just like make it up land kind of for maybe a hundred yeah. meters on either side of that barrier. And then after that, you're supposed to have it dialed. I oh think, my God. I think that was so a yeah, that, that note on the dash, it, it really brought me like peace of mind. I could glance yeah. at it and be like, okay, yeah, I'm definitely doing the right thing. This, I feel more, you know, I feel more comfortable right now. I think it was a, so a, were there any a top gear Chris bit God. in the Africa special? And I think it was the same border. I think it was Uganda and Rwanda that they switched back to the whichever side they were supposed to be on. And the, one of the co-hosts, they were like, nah, you're just messing with me. And then all of a sudden, somebody was driving at him, horns blaring, like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> it's exactly how it goes, because I drove down the whole coast of West Africa, and, and every single country is drive on the right. So it's, you know, left-hand drive Jeep, drive on the right. It's natural. It's easy. Mm-hmm. And then the day I drove into <laughs> Namibia, there's no sign. There's no nothing to let you know. And so I drive away from the border, like on the other side of the road for the first time in many, many years. But, you know, it's, it's the wrong side of the road because you, you're steering from the left, but, right. you're, but you're also driving on the left. And so the first car that came towards me, it's just like this, this flinching moment where you're like, oh, crap, Ooh, is this going to work out okay? <laughs> <laughs> you, you just kind of like hold the steering wheel a bit tighter than usual. And you're like, oh, I guess that worked. <laughs> well, either it works or it doesn't. <laughs> you find out one way or the other. Pretty much. Yeah. It, and it just, reminds me, yeah. nowhere near the same comparison, but I was in like seventh grade and I went to Canada with my parents and suddenly everything was in kilometers per hour. There's no introduction to that. Growing to school in the US, they don't teach you that. And I remember looking at the speedometer on the rental car and just being like, oh my God, we're going 130 miles per hour, <laughs> not realizing it was obviously kilometers per hour, you know. And my dad sitting in the steering and the driver's going, holy shit, we're flying, playing, you know, <laughs> joking around. Um, and speaking of Chris, I meant to mention that to you. Dan, this is my second fourth gen forerunner, the one that I had first. I bought in Canada and imported from Canada myself. And my brain still can't get the speedometer right because this one has miles per hour up top and kilometers per hour on the, on the inside. And I still look at the top one thinking it's kilometers per hour and have to like do the swap back and forth every time. That's not a good one to ignore in the US based Jeep. It's okay to ignore yeah. it in the Canadian version, but you need to pay attention to those yeah. top numbers down here. I mean, flow of traffic, but it. Yeah. I'm still programming my brain after, you know, years with that other one um okay so were there any aside from swapping visas and you know changing paperwork and 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 all of that was there any other country to country change you had to go through to make the trip happen or was it basically you have your you know your all your paperwork in order the jeep is what it is and you don't have to change you know license plates or registration or anything right that's right. Yeah, it's it's actually a lot more straightforward than most people realize. There's there's kind of like an international convention that says you can drive your vehicle as it sits right now in essentially every single country in the world. Hmm. And because it's registered and insured in its home country, that's good enough for any other country around the world just to let you drive it through as a tourist. Wow. So it's it's the big distinction. You you're not actually permanently importing it, so you don't have to pay import taxes, it doesn't have to pass emissions, right. all of that stuff it's purely on a one month or sometimes a three month kind of, you know, temporary thing. And basically at the border, they get you to fill in some paperwork. What's the VIN number? What color is it? Blah, 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 stamp, stamp, stamp. And then they're like, here you go. Here's your piece of paper. It's valid for a month. Have fun. See you later. And there were some places you did opt for, they, or they may, they entice you to get insurance locally. That's right. Yeah. There's a couple of countries where it is legal, um, like a legal requirement to get collision insurance. And it's like $10 for a month or maybe $20 for a month. And realistically, it's probably not worth the piece of paper it's written on. 
right. but it, it's probably more suit. work than it's worth should you need it. Yeah, yeah, but you have to get it, so you do, and then you're free to go. Mm-hmm. So Chris pulled up a picture. What, Chris, what was that picture? Um, we're, we're, he's pulling pictures live here from, I think, Instagram. Yep. Um, Dan's Instagram is a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Which is uh, at what, the road chose me for the audience. <laughs> so truck stuck at, can't see the rest of those words, exit of river. So did you go around that guy or did you try to help him? It looks like some kind of like cargo truck. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. And yeah, I went around him like just to the right of him, which made the exit kind of a lot steeper and a lot slicker, uh, but didn't have any trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, <laughs> is that and this just kind a road? of thing? Uh, yeah, I guess you'd call it a road, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this kind of thing is just extraordinarily common in Africa where you can drive along for hundreds of miles and then you just come across a vehicle that's like stuck in the mud or broken down or out of gas or, you know, all the tires are flat. And it's just like part of life for them because they've been, you know, repairing this thing. It's been on its last legs for 20 years. Right. So it was really common, actually. I came across vehicles that didn't have a starter motor and had like stalled in a mud pit just like that. You know, the the driver had stalled it trying to drive up something. And so, you know, why doesn't it run? Oh, no, it runs fine. It just doesn't have a starter. (laughs) I just can't make it run. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And normally they just push start it, but, you know, it's in an awkward spot and, so then you sort of say like, oh, why doesn't it have a starter? He's like, oh, I sold it so I could buy more diesel. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so, so how long? He's like, oh, five years ago. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so they, they drive around a vehicle for five years that doesn't have a starter motor because it's not really essential. You don't actually need it. So why bother having one? Technically, you only I need guess. It stuck in a mud pit. This is like, <laughs> yeah. it, it takes, and every time it happens, it, it really, like, you kind of do this big like WTF moment where you're like, what did you just say Mm -hmm. the the way that africans think and the way that they just pare things down to like bare essentials Mm -hmm. like that's nuts but it makes sense but it's true like you're absolutely right and then you're like yeah okay yeah good man and and usually like if it was a smaller vehicle i'd give it a push or give it a tug start or whatever if i could but you know like a truck of that size i was just Mm -hmm. totally outgunned and the jeep had no hope of helping they need another truck of that size to help them out exactly right yeah it sounds like there's a sense of like adaptability that we just largely not to speak for everybody but for the most part in the States here, we don't deal with that. So we don't know how to do it. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? That is like fundamental to life in Africa. And it, it definitely changes the way that people relate to each other. And because especially I remember crossing the Congo, it's really harsh and really remote and there are no spare parts. There is no infrastructure of any kind. Mm -hmm. And so you really get this sense of like, everybody has to work together. Otherwise none of us are going to make it. Like you you can't go it as a lone wolf because sooner or later you're going to run into trouble. So it's just this ongoing process of like, you help me and I'll help you. And, you know, maybe you end up in a bit of a convoy or maybe, you know, a whole bunch of locals jump in the back or on the Jeep or whatever. You help them get to the next village and then something happens in the village where they help you. And so it's this, it's, it's much more community focused of like, let's all help each other and let's all work together. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's the off-road community. We talk about it all the time. And given these are two separate sides of what you can see from the off-road world, whereas you're seeing communities coming together in the off-road world in the U S you see the little pockets of people who come together to help and fix things and, you know, make it work when somebody's in need. Um, I mean, we see, all the time out West in death Valley and in places out in California and the deserts that, that flood people go and get stuck. And then it's, you know, five, six vehicle recovery team goes out and rescues everybody. So it seems kind of a common thread. Um, but it, you know, I'm sure Definitely. it happens in the car world too, but the four by four world, it's, it's certainly, there's a different aspect of, of necessity that comes with it. Definitely. And, and I think that's part of what draws us into the community is that real feeling of camaraderie. And like, then we are part of a crew, we are part of a team. And, and that, you know, that gives us a nice warm, fuzzy feeling. Mm-hmm. So speaking of fuzzy feelings, ah, segue. <laughs> um, in tires. your tires, no. fuzzy, tires do sometimes make fuzzy feelings. <laughs> um, you're the, the first trip, the America's trip. What were your highlights? Ah, uh, um, the trip. I mean, it it changed my life. It's it's phenomenal. But if you want, there's, there's a couple of things that I'll never forget as long as I live. 
Um, Alaska is the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my whole life, really? still to this day. Oh. So I always say Americans, Canadians, you owe it to yourself. Find a way to get a couple of months off work and drive up there in the summertime. You know, June, July, August, the sun's going to be up. It's not cold. <laughs> when um, you have more than like six hours of sun. <laughs> oh, oh, it'll be 20 hours or 24 hours if you go far enough north. That's amazing. But, you know, like glaciers, moose, grizzly bears, wild camping, super friendly people. It's breathtaking. And, and you know, it is part of your country. So it's you definitely mm. owe it to yourself to go and hang out in Alaska for a couple of months. Just have to fly there now. <laughs> you can't drive yeah, there. Yeah, with Canada being closed. But fingers <laughs> yeah. crossed that'll change soon. I hope so. Um, down in Guatemala, they've got lots of active volcanoes, and I poked lava with a stick on one of these volcanoes, and like roasted oh, marshmallows, boy. and uh, yeah, you could stand like right next to the lava until like the hair on your arms were melting. It was nuts. Nah. Chris taught geology, and I've I, I minored in geology and still explore geology. That uh, that sounds like kind of important. <laughs> it's one of those like pinch yourself moments where you just say like I, I can't believe this is real it's like i'm actually watching discovery channel right now <laughs> i am the discovery channel <laughs> where's the guy in the shiny shiny suit yeah. like <laughs> where's david Attenborough? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much or and of course because it's guatemala like there's no safety fence there's no you know like it's all just on you i could have easily just walked over there and like picked up the lava if i wanted to it was, it was like three feet away from me oh my god here yeah. you would need like there's a fence and a barrier and a moat and then like lawyers <laughs> exactly yeah yeah um, so that was incredible it up. <laughs> <laughs> yes and then uh down you, you've seen tons of photos and you've heard all about it the salt flats in bolivia the uh, uni mm. salt flats that they go into the atacama desert in chile that at the time was like the biggest adventure of my life kind of six or eight days way way out in this like unbelievable alien landscape super harsh like severe sunburn during the day and then like well below freezing at night oh my god yeah really really incredible and amazing just i mean i guess you're on gravel tracks for the whole time but it's there's not really a road mm -hmm. my yeah. my friend who lives in salt lake i was discussing going to the salt flats for speed week one time and he mentioned to make sure that i put sunscreen up my shorts <laughs> Because there's such a reflection off the sand from the sunlight that it's shooting sunlight up your shorts. And so if you haven't uh, applied proper protection up there, you're going to have some crazy sunburn underneath your shorts. Yeah. I like the recommendation to wear pants when you go to Bonneville. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, that's a much you better. You get sunburned on a place you've never gotten sunburned before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is. It's like being on a different planet. It, it's mm. unbelievable. Yeah. So... I would, Chris, I would assume ahead. the full Larry Chen. Yes. I want long pants. I want long sleeve Huge and I want a hat. giant hat with a thing down the back. <laughs> yep. Yep. Dan, so you had malaria. Did you get sun crazy? Any, any bad sunburns? You were probably behind the wheel for a lot of the time, you know, shielded from direct sun, but you know, malaria yeah. was the biggie. What else? Yeah. I think my Australian upbringing uh, prepared me pretty well for sunburn, you know, okay. like, you just put sunscreen on every single morning when you get out of bed. You, you, well, you know, you brush your teeth, you put sunscreen teeth, on. Sunblock, it yeah. Just is, <laughs> yeah, and sometimes twice a day, you know, and, and I had a big hat trying to keep the sun off. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I got, I got a few stomach bugs here and there, you know, from eating local street food. Um, but really, all in all, you know, nothing major. No, no trips to the hospital other than malaria. Mm. You know, no cuts, no animal mm. bites. Um, I saw a bunch of scorpions and a few snakes and things, but they never gave me any trouble. Mm -hmm. So you self-treated when you had malaria, right? That was all on the fly, just take it as it came? Yeah, pretty much. Um, the first time I got it in Mali, I was staying in like kind of this overlander camping place. Um, and someone there went down and bought the drugs for me. And then so I took the drugs for a few days and mm -hmm. it actually wasn't that bad kind of like the worst flu you've ever had where you kind of just you just wrecked for like three or four it's days a, it's not good <laughs> no no but it, you know afterwards i was like oh that's no big deal i'm tough right <laughs> and then and then i got it a second time when i was in angola uh and it absolutely wrecked me for for five days i couldn't eat sleep walk talk drink anything oh. um, i lost oh. 20 pounds in five days holy shit yeah, yeah. And I was, I was traveling with this German couple at the time. And so we were just like camping out in the wilderness. So couldn't really go to a hospital. 
Um, but we planned ahead for this. We bought the prevention or the, the medication mm-hmm. earlier and we bought the injectable format, which is way stronger. Mm-hmm. So morning and night, they were giving me needles in my backside to oh, try, and, try and help me pull through. Damn. Did you do any kind of days. prep? Yeah. Yeah. And, like and before was, you, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. It was one of those moments in my life. So this German couple, you, you know, they're German and uh, Didi, he's a, he's a mechanic and he's a big guy. He's got mechanic hands. And so for five days a night, I would drop my pants and he would stick a needle in my backside. And so it was, it was one of those moments in life where I'm like, what bad decision led me to getting a needle in my butt from a German mechanic <laughs> on the side of the road in Angola? Like, where did I go wrong? Uh, Surely this is something my mom warned me about and I right? shouldn't, shouldn't mom, have ended up like are you, this. Are you proud? <laughs> And I remember being like, I was, I was so out of it with malaria that like, I, I didn't think it was funny, but at the same time, I knew it was funny. I knew it was ridiculous. You know, he was biting his tongue, trying not to laugh as he was doing it. Because oh, they he were was... loving it. They, they took a photo for me. So there's, there's <laughs> photographic evidence of this. Very great. I feel uh, like at, at the end of day two, though, they start to go, come on, man. Like, <laughs> right. Can't you do it yourself? <laughs> day two? Like, oh, three more days after that? Like, I, I can't handle yeah. it. 24 hour bug yeah it was a thing it was definitely a thing did you prepare or do any like field preparation kind of stuff to know how to treat yourself or how to deal with that on the feet in the field prior to leaving or you knew you had to buy the kit you knew i had to be prepared and that was it yeah i kind of did as much research as i could talking to other people who've made the trip and you know reading online and i didn't take any specific training courses um Mm -hmm. i've done a bunch of wilderness first aid like previously in my life yeah. Um, and so I just educated myself as best as I could about malaria, you know, and I figured, you know, sunburn, regular burns, cuts and scrapes, things like that were likely. So that's kind of what my first aid kit was stocked full of. Um, but, you know, nothing wild. I, w- I wasn't prepared, you know, if, if, if I got a punctured lung or something, I wasn't carrying anything special for that. There's no, man, I don't know if there is a way to be prepared for that prior. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I definitely have some wilderness first aid training, but not nothing like really heavy. Mm-hmm. So, so sickness, I mean, how many days was this trip until it was like a thousand or so? Yeah, it was 999 days. Perfect. <laughs> so it was what, maybe 10 to 15 days of being sick total. Oh, maybe more like 15 to 20. <laughs> Even so that's, that's a, a very small number. I mean, it's pretty amazing. That's right. Yep. And really most days that I was sick, I was like, oh, whatever, I can soldier through, you know, just mm-hmm. upset stomach. You can't be like, oh, it happens. Yeah. You deal with it if you have to. Is yeah. part of that because you're you were literally by yourself so much? Like you weren't really around a lot of no germs to share. Other humans to like <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. And I definitely ate street food like at every <laughs> opportunity. So I, you know, I was inviting stomach bugs for sure. Mm-hmm um Tempting. yeah that's it that's a good question if that's why i got sick less often yes. how how frequently and and for roughly like how many days or miles do you think you actually had a passenger ah yeah in the africa trip actually i had a girlfriend come with me for for different segments of the trip mm-hmm. and then i convoyed with other people and i also had some backpackers on board from time to time uh, and a friend from the states flew out and traveled with me for a few weeks I'd say maybe 40% of the time there was someone. Oh, wow. Maybe oh, that's, 50% of the time. That's way more than I actually expected. Mm. Even so, 50% of the time with nobody to breathe the same recirculated air, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But so, okay. So disease wasn't anywhere. I mean, it, it could have been, it sounds far worse, but did you find any any personal like psychological limitations did you ever just like hit a wall where you thought you were done aside from when you know jeep was on its side uh were there did you have days or you know stretches where you thought you were just checked out and done yeah definitely on both trips i get to my limit of being lonely and just i start to really question what's the point why am i even doing this you know i'm i'm all by myself i don't even have anyone to share these amazing experiences with and, and to this day, you know, it's, it's sort of disappointing when, you know, I, I can't turn to someone and be like, oh, do you remember when we were driving down that riverbed and we saw the elephant, you know, and mm-hmm. it's like, nope, I can never say that because no one was there. <laughs> oh. um, and so on both trips, I guess I, I did sort of think about giving up or I did think like, ah, oh, this is stupid. 
and and usually that happens i realize when i'm exhausted or i'm hungry or i just have sort of i i say you know i'm full up with experiences and i just can't mm. take in any new ones so actually when i was in ecuador i stayed put for five months and i managed a hostel oh, wow so I didn't even drive the Jeep for five months. Mm. And so that was a great way to sort of like, you know, process everything and then get me excited to get back on the road. Psychological reset. Totally, totally. And then I did exactly the same thing in Mozambique. I stayed in one place for almost a month mm. and I literally just went surfing every single day at sunrise and sunset and didn't do anything else for the whole month. <laughs> that and is it, the dream. Yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it really helped me kind of reset and get more energy again and sleep properly and get some Mm -hmm. exercise in and then i was like okay i'm excited to keep moving again were you able to exercise at all not so much nearly as not nearly as much as i wanted to um Mm -hmm. the heat and the humidity and the dust are ridiculously intense in most of africa yeah so pretty i loved getting out of bed at like the first hint of sunrise because it would be like almost cool and you Mm -hmm. could like feel coolness on your skin if you're wearing a t-shirt but by probably 7 a.m. that was passed and you were already sweating and oh, like wow. uncomfortable. So it was, you know, if, if you tried to do three push-ups, you'd just be puddled in sweat and you're like, oh, gee, this isn't so interesting. So it was air conditioning on from the moment you got in the driver's seat. I actually tried hard not to use the air conditioning. Um, someone had told me that if you do that, if, if you use it too much, you'll get really acclimatized to it. And then every time you get out, the world feels horrible and you end up hiding in your car too much. Mm -hmm. And so I did that probably for about the first uh, quarter of the trip. And then somewhere around the Congo when the humidity was off the scale, I was like, I don't care. I'm using the air conditioning. (laughs) (laughs) I can't do it. (laughs) And then I use the air conditioning a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, AC is, it's so easy to take it for granted. You know, even if we go on a day trip, locally like on the atvs or in the trucks or something if i know i'm going to be outside or if we go hiking the last like 10 minutes before we get there i'll always just like look around make sure nobody's watching and just like turn the air off you know or turn the heat turn the heat up so that you get there you're not like freezing immediately but it's so it's so easy to take it for granted and i'm i can't even begin to imagine if it's that hot or humid like what a luxury it is Oh, it was, it was incredible. And, and to this day, the air conditioning blows cold enough that like it'll make my hands cold on the steering wheel. So <laughs> wow. it, it still works really well here. Yeah, I'm super happy with it. That's, that's a, actually amazing. So in, in terms of the Jeep, what went wrong? Like what kind of maintenance did you have to do aside from, you know, a, you said you lost a sway bar link in a pothole. Yep. Was there anything, you know, because you, you probably could have very easily had to change an ac compressor if you had overtaxed it and and you know sheared something but was there anything really unexpected that caught you by surprise other than tires and oil changes no no actually the jeep was phenomenal like it it never let me down it never left me stranded um the joint on the front drive shaft i tore the rubber boot and then so it it spat out all of its grease and i Mm -hmm. had to change it in south africa but it wasn't packed with grease properly. So then it died again in Uganda. Um, so I had to take the front drive shaft off and I just drove for like a month without four wheel drive. And that was really the only actual like trail fix. And that was the only, you know, sort of incident mechanically speaking. Mm. Um, and I, I planned it all along. South Africa has a really big Jeep kind of presence. You know, there's mm. big aftermarket and upfitting shops and whatever. So I drove the whole West Coast about 40,000 miles. And then down in South Africa, I did an extra large round of maintenance. So I did, you know, all of the fluids in the transfer case and the mm-hmm. transmission and all of that. I put in new U-joints. I actually had a new clutch put in, partly because mm-hmm. I bought the Jeep used and, and I didn't know what the condition of the clutch was. And the more I thought about it, the more I would rather have it done in a good professional shop in South Africa. It's more reputable than, that you can actually... Yeah. yeah, rather than like try to figure it out on the side of the road in Sudan. Didn't, didn't sound like that would be that would have been an adventure in of itself yeah yeah so so in south africa I, I did do sort of more significant maintenance but it really was mostly just you know wear items and maintenance yeah it straightforward anything. yep yep and and i really enjoy doing all of that stuff myself so that i can have a really good look around at everything and, and make sure everything looks straight and you know there aren't oil leaks yeah. where there shouldn't be and yeah there is a special confidence that comes in maintaining your own things that you're going to spend that much time with, or, you know, in the sake of the ATV world on, um, 
even if you're not a spectacular mechanic, not rolling my eyes at myself here, it, it, if you know what's happening underneath it, it just, you have that sense of like, okay, if I have to climb under here and I see an oil leak or I see grease spewing out and I didn't see it before, then I know something has changed and I know yeah. something needs to be addressed. Um, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And, and one of the great things that I've kind of learned from my trips or a habit I've picked up whenever I buy gas in, in most of other countries, someone's always pumping it for you. So you kind of end up just standing around with nothing to do for five minutes. So I developed this habit where every single time I'll open the hood and check the oil. And so, oh. yeah. So now in life, whenever I'm buying gas, I check the oil. And of course, while you're under the hood, you know, you, you touch the, the serpentine belt, you give the batteries a wriggle, you, you know, you have a look down the side of the engine. Is there an oil leak? And, and I always say, you know, if the engine had blown up at some point, at least I would have said, well, you know, I, I did my best and I just checked the oil mm -hmm. two days ago. And so mm -hmm. I, I don't feel that it's my fault. But if I went a whole month without checking the oil and then the engine blew up, I'd be pretty down on myself. So yeah, might yeah, just, just a good away. habit that I've developed to, to constantly check things. And, and even mm. in the morning when I'm brushing my teeth, I kind of, I walk a lap around, like kick the tires, maybe crouch down and have a look at the brakes or just kind of look at the end of the tie rod. Like just not really looking for anything specifically, but just in general, like mm. has anything actually fallen off since last time? Is shit where I left it? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And like you said, you know, is there a major oil leak, which, you know, it could happen for sure. Mm -hmm. So obviously TJ to JK, you have a, a, a Jeep, you know, a, uh, I can't even think of the word. You like Obsession? Jeeps. Obsession. <laughs> no, I, that's a strong word. Aficionado? A f yeah. Well, fan? Well, yeah. You're a Jeep <laughs> fan. We'll leave it at that. But was there any consideration for anything different? A Land Cruiser, um, you know, a Mitsubishi, anything, you know, Nissan, something that is also kind of seen around the world? Or was it, you knew you were going Jeep after the first trip and that was it? Yeah, no, there, there definitely was a lot of consideration. Um, you know, and I still have an Australian passport, so mm -hmm. I could fly to Australia and buy any diesel Land Cruiser that I want. Like, that's easy for me. Um, but I, I, a big part of it is, you know, my little Jeep did so well without ever breaking down. So, mm -hmm. so I knew that it was going to be up to the challenge. Um, as well as that, here in North America, the Jeeps are inexpensive, I think, compared to everything else. Quite. The, the uh, range of aftermarket so products is, is enormous, you know, and, and things mm -hmm. like the pop-up roof that I have on mine, you know, custom made for that vehicle, right. I think is, is a big win compared to, you know, if I got a Pajero or, or some other vehicle that isn't as sort of customizable. Right. Um, Fixed roof. And, and yeah. And yeah. And then, ways. and then really the final thing that I thought about is a big part of what I'm doing is that I want to show people out there what's possible and, and that you can go and live your dreams. If you want to, you don't have to buy a hundred thousand dollar strange import land cruiser that, you know, doesn't exist in your country and is really difficult to get. And no, no, I, I really want to show people like, Literally, I bought my Jeep used on Craigslist for $17,000. I spent a bit more than that upfitting it. And then I just drove it all the way around Africa. So, yeah, that's you know, amazing. I, I, yeah and, and anyone in North America can buy one of those Jeeps. You know, they, they literally mm -hmm. a dime a dozen. So I, I wanted to show people like, you can do it. it. You don't have to be a millionaire. You don't have to buy this mm -hmm. kind of really exotic vehicle. Right. Yeah. There's, we always talk about how there's a stigma that even just to go into the woods for a single day, people seem to think on the internet that you have to have lift tires, you know, sliders, winch bumpers, uh, roof rack, like all that crap just for the single day trip. But I mean, you built yours. It looks like every single thing on there you, you used and used quite to it's, you know, it, the extent of what it could be used for. Is there, so is there anything you would have done like, modifications or accessories that you would have done or, or built differently? Yeah, there's a couple of things that I would change. Um, the Jeep is too heavy, essentially. It's, mm. it's sitting right at its GVWR. It's, it's 6,000 oh, wow. pounds, mm. which you know is heavy for a Jeep. Um, but other than filling it with helium balloons, I don't really know how to fix that. Um, yeah, but what I did learn, <laughs> yeah, that's what I did learn the lesson though, is, you know, most people say you should start with a good suspension upgrade and good tires, which I don't really disagree with. Mm. 
-hmm. except if you upgrade your suspension early on, you don't have any idea about how heavy your vehicle is going to turn out because you might add a fridge, you might add a sleeping setup, you might add a kitchen, drinking water, extra fuel, blah, 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 blah. Water is very heavy. People forget. Yeah, yeah. We, we We all end up with lots of stuff. And so what I've learned, my lesson is that I'm going to build my next vehicle exactly as I want it and I'm going to use it for a month and it'll probably be you know, heavier than the stock suspension can handle. But then most importantly, I'm going to put it on a weigh scale. I'll know exactly how much it weighs and then I'm going to find a suspension that is designed to carry that amount of weight. Right. So it isn't just a suspension that's you know three and a half inches of lift because that's irrelevant if it can't handle the amount of weight that I need to carry. The thing with sports cars is that you can, for example, on a Miata, you can modify the suspension knowing you're not really going to change the weight of the car unless if you, for some reason, decide to gut it or do like lightweight wheels and and such. But the weight's not going to change that much. Whereas in something like a JK, once you add bumpers and sliders and skid plates, you could be up a thousand pounds before you even know it. And tacking that suspension spring like even just going up in spring right the fourth the other fourth gen forerunner i had before i sold it um i put ome uh i had to get rid of the bill stein 5100s that were on it because they were just like there was just nothing they were just like i uh, the word i jokingly used was flaccid because they were just kind of just like bouncing on each other yeah Yeah. Um, pretty gross word to use for that but uh, but floppy yeah, they were really too jiggly. Um, but then I, I I got OME springs, assuming I was going to add more weight to it and never actually added that weight And by the time I sold it. And it rode like shit. Like, it was so stiff. And it would have been fine with full skids and a bumper and some other stuff and like a swing out and a big spare tire. Uh, but it, it just never was. Uh, so people, people forget that because they go, I'm just going to lift it. It'll do a three inch lift or a four inch lift. And suddenly, you know, you're seriously over or under sprung and it, it can be dangerous too. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that is a tricky one too. If, if you're going to daily drive your vehicle, because maybe it's really heavy on the weekends, but then it's much lighter during the week. And, and that is definitely a hard balance to mm-hmm. strike in, in that regard. I'm kind of, uh, I've got it easier because mine's just going to be heavy all the time. <laughs> Cause you, yeah, you live with it like that. <laughs> yeah. I saw somebody yesterday in town in a two door JK lift bumpers, like high lift on the back and everything. And they had like, it was, it was built to be on like probably 37s and he was on like 32s with blizzax like full winters, but it was very clearly like his winter setup. It looks so funny. Yeah. Um, yeah it looks like a roller skate. Yeah. But you alluded to next vehicle. Any any thoughts? Anything you can reveal, or is this still just kind of speculation, like in the back of your head that you're you're working on? Uh, it's getting beyond speculation. I'm getting very close, um, but I'm a little bit reluctant to talk about future plans because of COVID. Everything is so up in the air right now mm-hmm. with borders closed and you know travel restrictions. And I don't want to be the guy who t- always talks about doing things, but then doesn't end up doing it. Mm. I, I, I want to wait until it's, you know, a hundred percent locked in and I really know what I'm doing next before sure. I start talking about it. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. Um, I very much appreciate that. There's far too much of the off-road community. Likewise, that is just all about building things and not actually utilizing it. And it, it all kind of goes hand in hand. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Hopefully it, it, the world normalizes sometime soon and, and everybody can return to their lives and travel. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. sure and you're, you're pretty eager. When was the last time that you were like in one place this long? Oh, it's been a long time since, since maybe five years, definitely oh a gosh. while before Africa, but yeah. And I will say too, my needs again, I'm a little bit lucky. <laughs> I very specifically, I'm going to purpose build a vehicle for a very specific purpose so it doesn't have to be a jack of all trades. It doesn't have to be my daily commute. So, so that's I'm I'm a little bit different in that regard. What I'm looking at and for where I'm going, sure. it, it's different needs than you know someone who who lives in the US. Mm. Um, but I think I'm hoping again to work towards something that is very like achievable and very like people people can take inspiration from it or learn because I hope people can learn lessons from what I've done wrong or what I've done right, and and help incorporate that into their vehicle or their trip. Mm-hmm. 
and hopefully their lives. Uh, I do want to touch quickly on the work less to live your dreams aspect of things, which seems to be more, it's not so much on the look where I've been, look where you can also go. It's more the ethos of uh, a work life balance mentality. Uh, you want to touch on that at all and how that led you to doing what you do now? Yeah, for sure. Um, when I was before the Pan American Highway, I was just working as an engineer, going to work every day. And I, I just kind of had a look around and I realized I could flip the autopilot switch on and, and sit there doing that until I was 65. And mm -hmm. there was no there was no interest, you know, sitting inside every day instead of whatever's outside the window. Um, and I was really lucky, actually, a guy I worked with, he just decided, he said, oh, I only work four days a week. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I just don't need any more money. What I need is more time so I can enjoy myself. He's like, so instead of buying a new car, when I have a day off work, I just walk to the park and read a book or I throw the Frisbee or like I do all these free things. So the, the money that I'm missing out on, is irrelevant anyway in my life. And so it, it really got me started down this path of like, trying to maximize the amount of time that I have not at work so I can actually go and do the things that I love doing and that I want to do. And it's, it's kind of a big game of basically try to spend less money so that you don't have to trade so much of your time to get more money. Right. So you have more time to do what you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's, and, you know, that's, um... that's a big part of the reason I bought both of my Jeeps used. Um, it's a big part of the reason that I did all of the upfitting work myself. Like, I'm always trying to save money and, and learn things where I can. And, and I really enjoy that. So what is in Australia, what is the, what's the work mentality? Because obviously you've seen what it's like in the States and in Canada and it's life here is very work focused. It's most people, most people project the live to, you know, uh, like, they go to work so that they can have a life, but most people's lives really are work. Is it the same in Australia or is it? It is. Of, yeah. Yeah. I would say it's pretty similar. Yeah. Okay. The majority of people go to work five days a week um, mm -hmm. and they, you know, kind of stuck paying off their car and their house and their cell phone and all of that stuff. So they're just sort of in the rat race until retirement at 65. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's exhausting. And I mean, it, almost feels like you're taking advantage of things when you, you ask for days off and it, it's such a psychological backwards, you know, kind of thing. But yeah, I know it definitely I, is. Yeah. Trying to embody <laughs> what you were just saying, you know, I think all of us need a little more of that, especially in after 12 months of, of hardship and struggle and just fighting to stay afloat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's a long process. You know, it's not the kind of thing that you're just suddenly going to snap your fingers and have a ton of time off work, but it's, you know, every day you can, you can try to save a little bit more money. And, and my friend always used to say debt is a promise of future labor. So if you owe someone money, you're basically just promising you'll go to work at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Whereas savings is the exact opposite of that. You basically have a promise to yourself that at some point in the future, you don't have to go to work because you've got your savings there to cover your right. living expenses. Hmm. Yeah. So that's when, whenever I think about trying to save money or I look at the balance in my savings account, I was like, this is my promise to myself that I'm going to take a chunk of time off and I'm going to, you know, go and do mm -hmm. something crazy again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, we, we talked with uh, Richard and Ashley from Dust of Glory. Uh, God, that was, that feels like five years ago, but I think it was just back in the spring. <laughs> I think desk, desk to glory. Did I, I think did you I said dust to glory again. <laughs> Man, I, I'm a fan it's a of Freudian both. slip. I know. I'm a fan of both. I know. Desk They're both good. Glory. I did get mm. Richard and Ashley right. I didn't mess up their names. <laughs> Fair. But that was the same thing they did. That like talking with them, they were like a day on the road for them when they were traveling down to Tierra del Fuego was like seventy five dollars a day. So every time they could put money away, they're like, that's another day on the road, not having to work. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's good to remember too, if you want it to be, it's, it's another day in some like beautiful place that you never, you know, like Alaska or like Tierra del Fuego that kind of is mind blowing. Like it, it is actually possible if, if you put in the hard work. Yeah. So it. Alaska, Tierra del Fuego, 
round out the five. What are the next three most beautiful places you've been? <laughs> Let's make them all Africa places since they, I know I've, I have friends who've done multiple trips to Namibia and they said it's unbelievable. Um, where else? Yeah. In Namibia and Botswana, they border each other. They are overlanders paradise. You know, you can wild camp, you can see elephants every day, super, super safe, super friendly. Mm -hmm. So I would highly recommend both of those. Um, it's expensive, but it's life bending when you see the gorillas in Uganda. Mm -hmm. They are indescribably big and you get within like three feet of them. It's ridiculous. You spent a while going from kind of camp to camp over there, right? See on the gorilla preserves. Yeah, I went to a bunch of uh, chimpanzee reserves, actually. Chimpanzee reserves. Yeah, okay. which was a, a, an amazing experience because there's a couple of places where you can actually, like, play with them. And it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Scrolling like crazy now to get to the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably quite a ways back. Okay, noted, noted. How about the Canadian Rockies? I, I, Banff is on my, like, next places to go list. Where else should we, should we target? Yeah, definitely the Canadian Rockies are amazing. And I will kind of say like the Alaska and Yukon are like the Rockies on steroids. So everything really? that you love about Colorado, everything that you love about British Columbia, the Yukon and Alaska are just like bigger, more more wild, mm -hmm. more remote, bigger mountains, more wildlife, less people. So in that regard, I think they're better. Okay. <laughs> That's just me. Certainly um, noted. Yeah, yeah. The salt flats in Bolivia, like I said, one of the most beautiful places in my life for sure mm -hmm. yeah I think the list just keeps growing <laughs> the list grows and and i always say to people it totally depends what you're into you know if you want to go and see beautiful beaches like costa rica or mozambique are incredible jungle and and all that is i loved gabon super friendly mm -hmm. people immense national parks elephants crossing the road just all the time <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and like camped on wilderness beaches, uh, just breathtakingly wild and beautiful. Mm. So, you know, desert, uh, crossing the Sahara was amazing. So it really depends what you're into, but there's no end of places to go and experience. Seriously, I, and for a lot of people, and this is something that we always talk about too, is that you just have to get started. Like I'm guilty of this too, because I largely am a part of this is, the state of the world at the moment, but I, I go to a lot of the same places because they're convenient. They're reasonably inexpensive to get to all things considered. And I can continue going about working while also just going back and forth. Um, and it's kind of a, a vicious cycle, partially of my own doing and, you know, also partially of my own doing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but as we're probably getting towards the end of the show here, I, I did want to just ask you, what kind of advice or tips would you have for anybody who's trying to really, I guess, uh, more adventure outside of their own comfort zone? Yeah, and I know it's always really daunting for people and, and everyone wants to know, like, how did I make the leap? You know, or people always talk about it like it's a big leap. And I always try to dissuade that and say, it never was a leap for me. It was just slowly dipping my toes in the pool. So, you know, like I said, when I had my first Cherokee, I would just throw some camping gear in the back and, and go camping for a weekend and mm. drive down an old dusty logging road and kind of see what was at the end of it and go for a hike. And, and so it's kind of over the years, I just practiced more and more, got more comfortable with driving off road and my vehicle, got more comfortable with my whole camping setup, figured out what I enjoy bringing for food versus what I don't need. And, and so it just became this like, process of like i really enjoy reading so i want to bring a bunch of books other people love fishing so they should bring some fishing gear you know like mm -hmm. slowly just practice and work up and keep keep the enjoyment factor as high as you can because when you enjoy something or you love something you're always going to find a way to make it happen you know because friday after work it's easy to be like oh let's let's just stay home for the weekend it's easier but if you're super passionate about going out there and catching a rainbow trout like Friday at 4.30, you're trying to sneak out of work so you can go. <laughs> so it's like find that passion, find the thing that you love and, and like go for it and go out and find excuses to do it more and more. Okay. I'm sure I'm, I know I'm taking that to heart. Chris is probably thinking the same thing and I, you know, listeners are definitely going to hopefully run with that and especially hopefully in 2021. Definitely, so yeah. 
as for your stuff, you have a YouTube channel, The Road Shows Me. Um, Road Shows Me on Instagram. There's the books on Amazon, right? Anywhere else to get them? Uh, Amazon, and you can get digital copies on Apple Books as well. Okay. And you're on Facebook and Twitter as well? That's right. I am. Yep. Okay. And, yep. Uh, and what else? Anything else you'd like to plug? Any, any other words of wisdom for us, us normal people, <laughs> us normal <laughs> off-roaders, I guess? Well, well it's, it's funny you would say that because I, I am a totally normal person. You know, I don't work for Nat Geo. I'm not a millionaire. I just had this dream and like got stubborn about it and went for it. And so what I'm trying to do on my YouTube channel is like, I don't want to be another guy who just shows people like me living my dream and me playing with my sure. toys, you know, in the woods. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying really hard to teach people how to do what I do. So everything from like how to save money to what you really need in a vehicle to how to ship your vehicle around the world, visas, all kind of the logistics, all the like, how do I actually turn my dream into reality? That's really what my YouTube is focusing on these days. Um, okay. And I'm, I'm always really happy too to film videos about stuff that people want to know about. So if people have questions or if they're like, oh, I, no one's ever talked about like, where do you go to the bathroom? I'm like, yep, I filmed a video about that because it is helpful and it, and it is kind of a, a thing. And you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and there's kind of, there's a million topics that like, they're not sexy and they're not on the cover of magazines like, you know, a lifted Jeep on 40 inch tires is. But I, I try really hard to, to help people and teach people to get out there and, and go and have their own adventure. So, so that's my plug for YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Keenly watching. And I mean, <laughs> obviously very much looking forward to what comes in the future. Do you have any, the, I know when you got back from Africa, you were doing the expo tour. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, uh, Chris and I had discussions about going to the Midwest Expo in on Valentine's Day. Do you have anything planned or is it very much just all in uh, up Everything's in, the, in the, the big COVID wish wash. I don't know. <laughs> the plan was to, to get to all of them again in 2021. Um, but I know they've already delayed the, the big Prescott one until mm -hmm. later in the year. So I, I have no idea what's possible. And, and actually the border between the US and Canada is still closed. So I, I can't even get down to the US right now to go to any shows. Yeah. Um, so it's, I'm, I'm hoping definitely to get to more shows, but I, I really don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm look, I, as, I, as you said that, I looked, at the, uh, I looked at today's date and remembered it was five years ago today I drove into Canada to buy my first Forerunner. <laughs> Sweet. So full Wait, circle. That's a good milestone. Yeah, full circle. And then I spent an hour today trying to unfuck the stuff that I messed up on the new one, that I, the <laughs> other one that I have. So it's, it's all part of it. What do they call that? The circle of life? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Buy perfect vehicle, screw up perfect vehicle, <laughs> spend time and money trying to fix perfect vehicle. There's no such thing as perfect. <laughs> Not unless you have crazy money, but you know that. Yeah. So, okay. Well, yeah, I think that's it. Um, follow all of all three of us, Chris and I write for Hooniverse. I wrote something about that weird Russian UAZ uh, Bremach Taos thing Taos. that might yeah. be Taos that might be sold here. Um, Chris has been writing more and more frequently. I, I have been down a rabbit hole lately of do-it-yourself electric vehicles. Um, holy crap, those things are expensive. Mm. Like not what the internet would lead you to believe. Yeah, there well, there was uh, it's a completely different tangent, but like there were some that it was like if you go buy a used forklift motor for a couple hundred bucks, maybe it's not bad. But every like single a... time the same thing is still batteries. Batteries are so expensive. So every I've been on EV West website, I've been on like it it just so many of the kits were like, here's our kit for this number. And then good luck getting batteries. Like it, it was mm -hmm. just, yeah. Anyway. Batteries only new for manufacturer for $7,000. Okay. Yeah. No. Like it makes so, Brad's idea with his Nissan Leaf slash Boxster that more impressive to me. Yes. And all the kudos in the world to him, but in, <laughs> impressive doesn't necessarily mean rational. And I say that lovingly. Yeah. <laughs> I love this project. I still want to see when it's done. Doesn't I just don't want my hands anywhere near it. <laughs> in, in Brad's defense, none of his vehicles are rational. True. Very true. 
no, but, and, and it's definitely the irrational ones we fall in love with, and exactly. definitely those that like captivate us the most. But of course, we didn't work on it, so we don't have the bloody knuckles and all the swear words to go with it. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> the truer words may never have been spoken. <laughs> Yep. So yeah, that's our show. Dan, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we encourage everybody to go read your stuff on your website and pick up the book. And hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we can all get together and have a laugh sometime at an expo in the near future. Look forward to it, guys. That was a lot of fun. Thanks. Great.